Good evening. Thank you for coming, and uh, thank you, Heather. So um, we may need to dim the lights a bit to uh, see these slides, but um, the question I've asked is a question that we should all be asking literally right now. It's a good time. The news. The news is full of reports of, of the leaders of more than 180 nations that have gathered in Durban, South Africa, to discuss what progress might be made in international climate negotiations. It's also the time of year that we see, waiting for the advance here. Well, I'll use this. Uh, the reports of the previous year. It takes almost a year to compile data from the year before, showing in this case that carbon dioxide emissions show the biggest jump ever recorded for a single year. So on the surface of it, what you read in the paper about the Conference of the Parties meeting in Durban doesn't sound like very good news, and this sounds like pretty bad news. So if we put this in context <clears throat> and look, um, I think this gizmo just isn't working. Yeah, I've lost the pointer here as well. Hmm. I'd love to have the pointer if anyone can activate this. Thank you, Christoph. Terrific. OK, so from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change scenarios, a family of projections that were put forth in year 2000, and bear in mind, again, a lag of a year or so, at that time, emissions looked like they were about here, although they were actually here. The family projections looking forward from 2000 to 2015 had this sort of range. And then in real time, as you follow emissions of carbon dioxide, you find that they rose steeply during this period, dangerously close to an upper bound, and here fell off in 2009, which was, of course, associated with the global economic decline. Now, this shows current data. Uh, here's 1990 again. Here are those CO2 emissions. And here is what was reported in the headline news in the New York Times just a few days ago with that big jump. In other words, although there was a global decline, it seemed to uh, make up for lost time very quickly. And if you take those scenarios through a series of climate models and project from those carbon dioxide emissions what temperatures would be, this is temperature on the left scale. These are in degrees Celsius. If you're more comfortable with Fahrenheit, double it. It's pretty close. And looking out to 2100, you see how that family of scenarios gives a range of high temperatures, low temperatures. And this is a boundary at two degrees. There's nothing hard about it, but it's widely considered to be a value that we really cross at our peril. That is, as we move closer and closer to this, the likelihood of serious disruption of the climate system uh, becomes more and more concerning, whether it's a loss of of uh, ice in Greenland or a loss of, of a major forest in tropical regions. There are several scenarios that uh, become uh, increasingly concerning as we move the, towards this level. Now, if we look at where these CO2 emissions are coming from, uh, 1990 to 2010, here's the United States creeping up. Here's our economic blip, Russian Federation, Japan, India. And of course, we see this great growth in China over the last decade. Every other nation you can think of is below India and Japan on this line. They would be down in this level. So you can see why a, a couple of nations, a couple of nations are key to making progress in this area. And in fact, there are only about 20 nations that comprise about 85% of the emissions. So you can see that partnership in this group is key to making progress. But of course, China is emitting more these days because they're making these things that we fill our pockets with, these things we plug in everywhere. You look on the label, it says made in China. Uh, this is the trade of CO2 embodied, emissions embodied in the trade. And you see China exporting products which are carrying these emissions with them. So we can feel good about the US not increasing steeply. But one of the reasons China is increasing is we're buying a lot of things from China. This graph showing total emissions on the left in the red bar, again, China here, United States, Third would be India. Here's Russia. Other nations fail off. And on the right, in the black bars, though, is the amount of emissions per capita. So China here, at a little over one and a half tons 
uh, not quite one and a half tons per person. Uh, United States up closer to, in this, see this bar across here, um, up closer to three and a half. So, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong sale here, up closer to five. So, so even though China is producing a lot of uh, products that we're consuming, and that is here, much of that consumption is indeed uh, being used to, to supplement uh, what's being consumed in the United States. Now here's another graph that shows from 1960 to 2010 these emissions in carbon dioxide, and you see blips. So here's the oil crisis in the 70s, here's the Iranian crisis, here's the collapse of the former Soviet Union, and you see many of these are a blip where the slope is rather similar afterwards. This one is different, in part because Eastern Europe changed dramatically after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That is, in fact, on that earlier graph, a competitor for the U.S. for the most emissions per capita uh, was the former German Democratic Republic. And of course, that, that entire filthy economy was destroyed. It was rebuilt with the reunification of Germany, and that helps explain a change in the slope. But look at, look at the recent period, how steep this is. This is, again, largely China. And this curve, although it also goes up, it really goes down because these numbers are low here and high here. And this is the amount of carbon emission per unit GDP. So what you see here is, again, a slope which you want this to get to zero as fast as you can. And you see it follows these same sort of wiggles. And notice in this period that we're not making a great deal of progress. So is it really hopeless? Um, here from a, the very recent, uh, just last month, World Energy Outlook, and this is a complicated graphic, but, but uh, here's a trajectory that if, uh, if indeed uh, we were to hit something like six degrees, this is what we'd be doing, and a two degree trajectory would look like this, and this really points out that the later you wait to start this, the more difficult it will be. And this is a powerful um, distillation of that, which shows that here's that carbon intensity of GDP declining over time, uh, here's population increasing, here's per capita GDP and carbon emissions going up, but here's what I want you to focus on. Population increasing about 1.7% a year, per capita income about 1.8, carbon intensity decreasing 1.7, and although this is important, let's ignore it for the time being. You see, the problem is, although we're decreasing carbon emissions, we still have a net balance of about 2% a year. So we're reducing carbon emissions by, by uh, something in the order of 1.7%, and it needs to be more like the sum of these, something uh, approaching uh, 3 or 3.5%. Three is it hopeless? So here is Mayor Menino's plan for what the city of Boston could do, demonstrably can do, and is doing. Uh, the mayor's plan, uh, launched uh, uh, a year and a half ago now, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by uh, 2020. So think of that as about 2.5% a year. And is there a huge number here? Well, no, there isn't. Uh, vehicle mileage and greenhouse gas standards, 14%. Uh, this has to do with electric generation, 24 But notice what this is made up of is a lot of very small numbers. And what his task force determined was that this is really possible. In fact, the mayor originally expected that we'd probably only be able to do 20%. When the analyses came in, he was emboldened by the realization that progress already made demonstrated that 25% was not unrealistic. So let's think locally for a moment. Um, think of that, of that number we just talked about. Um, the Harvard goal introduced by President Faust a year and a half ago is a 30% reduction from 2006 to 2016, or about 3% a year. And we'll hear more about this, but this is extraordinary progress that has been made. Again, based upon confidence from previous progress that this was realistic. This, is, uh, this has uh, both the, the base building portfolio, but also uh, the emissions, growth emissions that is due to, uh, to a growth in buildings. But as you can see, and I think this is the message I want to leave you with, for those of you who have, have been here as a student for three and a half years, by the time you leave in four years, you will have seen real progress. So the point is that, that in, in small measures, 
which in many instances have absolutely no negative consequences for our lifestyle, for personal choices that, that uh, we would want to feel free to make, but by being really conscious, as this, as this previous graphic would show, of, of how these small changes add up to a significant change, uh, it's clear that the sort of leadership that is being shown in this area today are in campuses like this, in cities like Boston, cities all across the United States, cities around the globe, but unfortunately, as we know from reading the headlines of the paper, we're still lacking that same leadership in the international arena. So as all of you go forward, from Harvard College to myriad careers, uh, remember what you were able to do at Harvard. And, and keep in mind the realization that those small differences really do add up. And I will conclude at this point. Thank you. Thank you.